Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu viewers welcome to the show Real Talk with your host I'm Jadita uh, today is no different we have another guest who is a, a multi award winner uh, may I let you know uh, and today's topic is about leadership and especially women in leadership uh, the lines are, will be open telephone numbers 01274 214 299 it's also going to be uh, live streamed on YouTube on Ikra TV uh, they mention the word leadership and a lot of uh, sentiments will come to mind regarding leadership and we'll have a certain image that will fall from this regarding what we believe to be leadership. And in my opinion and what I've seen, it's there's not many, especially our community, and I, and I say our community, from the BME community who have been put on a pedestal. And I don't say that in a negative effect of putting them there to be admired and just uh, as a status, but they should be the norm and not the exception. So my guest today is Habib and Zaman. Uh, who is a, a multi-award winner and when I say multi-award I'm going to let her introduce herself and the award she's got because some of these uh, uh, acronyms that even I can't pronounce and get them out and I don't even know what they stand for really. So without further ado I'm going to go over to Habiban and introduce her to the uh, show. Habiban, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, I'm Jid. Thank you for coming and I know how busy you are so thank you for taking time out and coming onto the show because I think the topic is very relevant. Mm -hmm. Well thank you for inviting me and I feel quite honoured being part of the show tonight. Um, my awards have been coming in since maybe 2005. I've been a community activist for almost 30 years now and the first recognition was through the Savera Foundation as um, a, a woman of um, it, a woman in leadership role in 2005 and again at that time I was involved in um, many sort of voluntary organizations where it, one in particular where I, I where my career started from was uh, the Awaz newspaper which was a campaigning organization and writing community news locally from that that um, passion sort of stemmed on to um, getting involved in some of the women's work that was out there in the community because you know I was uh, one of the first women to um, be part of uh, from the BME community to be part of the organization so that sort of led my passion into going into more women's work in terms of um, going into which area that was a bit of a challenge because at that time women weren't seen as um, the ones that would be going out and becoming uh, sort of leaders or involved in some of the uh, roles that I, I was wanting to, to go into. From that I went into um, sort of doing development work and youth work, particularly with young girls, looking at um, some of the mainstream curriculum uh, things that were around at the time. And again it was sort of relationship development, uh, health and education, health and well-being. So my passion has really grown from that um, from that sort of uh, organisation and th the, the people that were involved in that organisation have always been my backbone. Bless them, they're still around, I can still contact them for any advice, any information. They're, they're prominent individuals in those communities and um, they, have, they hold a lot of respect for me and, and vice versa. So for, for me to have that sort of support within uh, the local community was a, a very challenging issue mm -hmm. at the time which led me to go into doing youth and community work and then going on to uh, specific sort of uh, organisations uh, like the Kirklees Women's Refuge. I helped develop that and became a management member. I went on to helping um, the Housing Association, Sandy Lock Housing Association, served on the committee for many years there. Um, Mill and Day Centre, working with the elderly. Again, that was you know close contact with some of these colleagues who were involved in developing that work. More recently, I um, picked up the award from the Kirklees Women's Alliance for Outstanding Woman in the Community, and then I went on to receiving the British em Empire Medal in uh, 2014 in the Queen's Birthday Honours list. And then 2015, I got the British Community Honours Award from the House of Lords. And that was for connecting communities and bringing communities together. And again, all of this has been possible with the support of my family and particularly my mother, who, bless her, I've taken time out now from work to look after her, but she's been there for me all her life and supporting me and my uh, two sons. And without her support, I wouldn't be where I was today. It's always refreshing and humbling to hear 
uh, the sentiments of thanking your parents for where you are. And I, I say that on every show, never bite the hand that fed you. You know, always stay humble and mm. uh, it's, it, it really is. It's, I mean, you've, you've achieved a lot, uh, if I may say so, you know, and you've been credited for it, you know, which, which is granted. However, is this hereditary? Is this the sort of line of work your family's gone through in the past? Or are you the one who's come into this work and for some reason you've had this passion and taken this on? Because it, it wasn't seen as a norm, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. in your generation, your era, when it happened. You know, so why, why journalists? Why, why this sort of work? Well, it was it was really um, it, it was a it was a paid position that I got with the with the Awards newspaper, and then I've sort of uh, nurtured other women and girls within my family that uh, have, to some extent, followed my footsteps and gone into further education. And um, they, I've got a fantastic little niece at the moment who I am nurturing and taking around with me to many of the campaign sessions that I'm going to, you know, uh, in the local community. So again, talking to her mom and trying to get her more excited about some of the real issues that are going on in our communities. We, we do have younger role models that are come up and coming within our communities. I'm also part of the UK Education Faith Foundation, which my sister's running uh, a charity in Oldham, feeding the homeless. So some of that has rubbed off with my siblings that have gone into similar work, charity work, and, and supporting disadvantaged sort of communities up and down the country. Th there's a lot going on, uh, and I don't know how you find the time to, to do it all, but credit to you for, for managing it. Uh, one of the things, that, uh, one of the ideas and the uh, setup that you d did was the domestic refuge, is it? Domestic violence domestic refuge? Domestic violence refuge, uh, yeah. Can you talk me about, talk through the domestic violence refuge, and was it targeted at specific community groups, or was it everybody who was looked after? No, with, within within the group that I was in at the time, we were finding that there was many um, BME women that were being um, fled through domestic violence up and down the country. There was nothing um, within the Kirklees area. So we campaigned to get some land within the, the area and um, funding to actually get the purpose-built refuge built and manage the services within that. At the moment, you know, th th we are catering specifically for BME women within the area, which is the only sort of refuge that's there. So, in, in this Kirklees region with the demographics, I don't know, say it was about 2.2 .2 million in West Yorkshire alone, but if you concentrate on one, one uh, aspect, how many numbers uh, overall, how, how many women would you say uh, visit this centre? It, it's, it varies and you know depending on the vulnerability of the individual that's going into the refuge the um, coordinators will decide which is the best refuge for them to, to be staying at because again you've got to you've got to understand that you know it's not seen as the norm for a woman to pick up her, her belongings and flee that home is not an easy task to do and then having to survive as an as a single parent maybe with children uh, and no family support at times there's women that have come from abroad that may not have any family within the UK so they've, they've got to set up their own support networks so going into a refuge isn't an, an easy option for them and then having to be rehoused somewhere again is, is not an uh, easy task for that individual so it would very much depend on the coordinators to analyse individual situations and make that assessment on that individual whether they stay within the locality or whether they uh, move out into the uh, into another area. What what sort of uh, problems have these people faced in their lives? It's not just all uh, physical violence, is it? Surely. No, it varies, and and uh, again, you know, we've got to take responsibility as a community as to what is happening within our communities. It can be uh, emotional abuse, it can be uh, physical abuse, and it could be uh, just mental torture that's going on with the extended families. We have to recognise that um, particularly women that are coming from abroad are self-harming themselves at the moment. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm coming across a number of women that have no alternative but to harm themselves because that's the only way they feel their voice is going to be heard. So when, when we're not acknowledging the issues within our own communities, you know, how are we actually wanting to address the problems in the wider community? We've got to look within our own families and extended families what is actually going on. We, c we can sit back and have a joke about it that so-and-so is this and so-and-so is that, but are we actually addressing 
the mental torture that individual may be going through. It's, and it is mental torture, it's very deep, like, like, like you mentioned. And there's a stigma attached, isn't there? And there's also a, a perception if someone's been divorced or someone's left home, especially if it's a female and it's come from a BME background, there's some sort of a perception and a stigma attached to that individual. Uh, you couldn't make it work, maybe it's your fault. You know, we're, we're, I'm not passing the blame here, but as a society, especially the community, and I, I, I'm Mr. Cynical and I put my hands up to that, uh, but we do have this. And this has been going on for, for, for years. Why haven't we caught up and moved on, in your humble opinion? I've got my views, and uh, I mean, I share mine openly every time I do the show, but what can we do to highlight this issue more, other than bury it under the carpet and it's someone else's problem? If someone slit the wrist, or, you know, there's a cry for help, well, that's more than serious, and we're going to push that under the carpet, and then there's no alternative left for them. And for them to have that only option proves to me that they've got no faith in the system, they don't know what else to do, and they've probably been brainwashed to say, if you deport it, they won't take it serious. Mm. Maybe that's just me. But to some extent, you are right, because if we look, in at, look at some of the w vulnerable women that I'm coming across, they, they may not be part of the system, they may not have children, so they can't be part of um, like the school system, know the education system, know who to contact, they may not be connected to any of the networks or the community organisations that are in their community. So they might speak to a neighbour, and once they've spoken to that neighbour, it's the dishonour and the shame that they've brought on that family. And we, we don't acknowledge that these are real issues that that individual is going through. And it'll be well, you know, again, targeting that, that family that, you know, it's the upbringing and maybe it's the family that the way she's been raised that she can't take the pressure that's in the kitchen. But again, you know, we, we're not actually looking at the role of that particular woman uh, in that family. We, we're expecting them to deal with extended family issues. Or, or deal with all, all the family that's within that house, whereas her responsibility is to her husband and her children. And until we don't get that right, we, we're not going to move on as a, as a community. He, I mean, I, I had to have a, a smirk when you mentioned uh, the woman and the kitchen. Uh, it's, uh, it's like, as a community, and, and I completely get that, you know, the role of a woman, woman is not to be uh, the, the, the slave as such and to do everything for us men. And, you know, they can be independent, can't they? And this, this is the key thing I mean when I say the people who come and visit your refuge centres, I'm guessing they're all not housewives, housebound. I bet there's some of them there who are independent, who have a persona, you know, who have a different personality. Once they go behind closed doors, they're a completely different person. And in public, they put up a face or put up a show just so they don't get them remarks, don't get them insults. And, you know, it's like different, living two different lives. Of course, y you're right. And in terms of the dishonour, that is the biggest... Um, biggest thing that we need to deal with that is our biggest issue because we, we continuously look at what others are going to say and and in some topics you know we'll say well it doesn't matter what anybody's going to say but then there's others that particularly where the control is on the on the female um, we, we do have that 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 we sort of concentrate on on the bigger picture what a community is about and what they're going to talk and talk about but then you know as a community we do need to move on because we're not supporting that individual and you know Fair enough, we, we kind of like believe that women are the homemakers and, you know, they are the, uh, the makers of those uh, communities, families, etc. But then how much support do we actually give that individual? Because any incident, instance that may happen within the family, you get the extended family involved and then it always comes down to that individual having to save the face of that family. Because it's always a woman's respect. So for for... For decades we've, we've been through this and how long are we going to continue that? Because until women don't support women and the families don't begin to support the families, we're going to be in that bubble. So the cliche of behind every successful man is a hard work of a woman has never been true. Uh, <laughs> it has been true. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it just goes to show it's not only the elders that need to take responsibility, it's women on women, as you mentioned. They need to be supporting the, their own, you know, uh, equality, gender equality side of things, rather than just passing the book onto somebody else. But is this a, a cultural issue, or is it? Have you seen this in other groups as well, or is it just specifically, generally, in the BME communities? I'd say it's more in the BME communities, whereas you know, within the white communities, I do see that you know they'll they'll move on. Um, generally, something will uh, will happen, and you know, the extended family won't have any contact with them because they'll just leave them to it. 
Whereas within the BME communities, particularly from my experience of the Pakistani community, you know, we, we will, we, you know, as, as women, we will torture other women. We will have that control over them. You know, as, as mother-in-laws, we'll want to make sure that, you know, our sons have a certain role and our daughter-in-laws will have a certain role. But, you know, at, at some point, we need to compromise with, with the families and move on, which we're not doing. And I, and I can't really see why we're not doing, because on the one hand, we're trying to show um, the younger generation that you know we've moved on, we're modern, and we have a modern way of thinking. But then we seem to hold on tightly to this culture that we've inherited from back home. Yes, and, and you mentioned back home, but well, some of these groups, their home is here. And <laughs> second, third generation, and we still attach yourself to certain values. And there's a time and a place, you know, which with, with everything in life, there's a time and a place. But if, if we're holding on to these values, so-called values that we uh, talk about, honour... But we pick and choose those values, don't we? Exactly. Is it a buffet system? <laughs> Definitely. We, we, you know, in my experience, we do pick and choose. We'll pick and choose what we like about those communities and, and what, we, what we want to let go, or should let go. We're not letting go. For example, in my experience, we can talk about um, the education system here and, and abroad. The, the young people abroad seem to be more flourishing than our young people here because we're not investing the time in them and we seem to be wanting to invest the time abroad. So where, where, is, where is the equality in that? You know, you may have one individual, from, one, in, one parent from abroad, but then why is it that our loyalties are still aligned with the, with the country that we've her heritage from? How do you change that mindset? It's changing very slowly, very slowly. But it's like those families where it is changing, they've been tarred with, with a very bad brush, really. So, I mean, if, if you're going to ostracise these families, you know, these communities, with, there's not going to be anything really we're going to achieve in the... Fa is there, you know, any groups that we need to be looking up to and saying, people have moved on, but we haven't moved on? It's not a quick fix. You mentioned it's not a quick fix. In your humble opinion, who needs to take responsibility? Everybody needs to take individual responsibility. I can't really say that it's so-and-so's responsibility and, and not somebody else's. Because at the end of the day, you know, we've got fantastic role models within, within our families, within our communities that we need to look up to and, and learn from them. Which, again, we take in things that we choose and are of personal benefit. And where we don't like what somebody else is doing, we'll use faith and religion, which, we, you know, we, we're living double standard lives. Uh, the, you mentioned the term double standards there, which we're going to come on to uh, after the break as well. But uh, thank you for everyone for that. Uh, viewers, there you go. We just started off with the topic about domestic violence because a refuge that uh, everyone's been working with and set up. But after the break, we will concentrate on the leadership and the more positive sides of getting our ladies to the pedestal who have done well and promoting their hard work where the credit is due, it needs to be given. So, inshallah, see you after this short break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.